And shalom. Welcome once again. This is Elder Alicia Halliburton. I'm so excited to be uh, able to share with you in our prayer school. Um, thank you for joining. And we always want to invite you to like, share, and subscribe, and to go back and check out the other teaching that has gone forth in the area of prayer. So without further ado, what we're going to be talking about on today is the prayer of agreement. And, you know, the prayer of agreement is commonly uh, in, in Christendom and in religionhood, <laughs> you know, uh, you hear a lot of cliches and, and a lot of uh, use of scripture without understanding of scripture. For example, you know, how many times have you heard people saying, well, let's just touch and agree. Let's just, uh, you know, let's touch and agree where two or three are gathered there. There uh, God is in the midst. And though that does come from scripture, a lot of times people um, are using that as a, a religious cover-up or just not having full knowledge of the prayer of agreement, what it was designed to do, and how we utilize that prayer of agreement in order to get results in our prayer life. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about is how do we um, utilize this accurately and with clarity. All right, there we go. Okay, so let's look at a foundational scripture that I, I kind of just referenced in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, and it reads, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my authority, I am there in the midst of them. So a couple of things we want to pull out of this. The first thing is, uh, the first principle that we see here, where it says, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth. So when two people or, or more than one person are coming into um, agreement and it says concerning anything that they ask, it will be done. So if you read back, uh, if you read in the verses prior, it's dealing with a law and it's dealing with the law. The, the scripture talks about whatever you bind um, on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you uh, loose or allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. That's the English rendering. However, when we understand that from kingdom concepts, we know that as ambassadors, it's not our plan. It's not our agenda. It's always the king's agenda and his plan. So that scripture should actually, a better um, interpretation would be whatever is already allowed in heaven will be allowed in earth. So whenever I'm praying, I must make sure, eat, especially when I'm coming into agreement with someone else, that whatever we're praying, we must know what is already legal and allowed in heaven. That is what we're able to pray in the earth. So when we look back at this uh, verse where it talks about uh, concerning anything that they ask, well, whatever we're asking, we know that it must agree with the laws, the precepts, the culture of the kingdom. So that means I can't just come up up come up with whatever I want, whatever we want, and and think that the Father is going to do it. No, I must have clear vision and understanding of what has already been established. So verse 20, it says, where two or three are gathered together in my authority. So that, uh, that word name, I'm so grateful for the teaching that Dr. Larry has uh, has done in this area so that now we fully understand that whenever we see name, it's not just talking about J-E-S-U-S -S or even uh, Yeshua, right? So what it's referring to is whenever we are speaking the word of the king in authority, with knowledge, then he is there with us in the midst. So let's look um, at... Uh, a few laws that must be understood when engaging in this type of prayer. So there are three laws in particular, and we're, we're probably only going to have time to uh, deal with one of them. But that first law is the law of witness, right? So again, 
um, in Matthew 18, where it talks about if two or three are gathered, right? So there is uh, safety in numbers. I'm sure that that's, you know, something that we've all heard. There's safety in numbers. And why is that? Well, because whenever, um, you know, the enemy, he likes to try to isolate to assassinate. He wants to get us doing our own thing, our own agenda, but by us coming together in unity, by us uh, believing the same thing, by us teaching the same thing, living the same lifestyle, we are unstoppable. So that law of witness, when I'm uh, praying the prayer of agreement, it is always good, or I should say necessary, for the witness or those other people who are present to be in agreement and to not only be in agreement, but to uh, check what is being spoken and ensure that it aligns with kingdom concepts. We don't want to just agree with anything. And then you're, you're praying uh, things that violate kingdom law. So if, if you're, you know, operating in the prayer of agreement, someone has asked you to pray with them and they're praying something that's contrary to the word, then we don't need to be agreeing with that, right? We need to have a conversation and say, hey, um, let's talk about this because this is a kingdom concept. I'll give you an example. You know, you have um, people who will ask for prayer. Um, for example, you know, recently someone was asking for uh, healing, uh, but that person is not born again. And so as kingdom citizens, one of our rights as being a kingdom citizen is that we have access to healing, but that does not necessarily apply to those who uh, don't have the spirit of Elohim in them. So for me to just outright and, and, and pray for healing for that person would be violating a law. However, when I have understanding of another law that, that I can engage and pray, for example, the scripture talks about by the cleanliness of your hands, so we can stand in the gap and, and offer prayer that way, but we have to be very knowledgeable of how to get things done. So anyway, so the next one, and we'll, we'll come back to that. The next one is the law of unity and then the law of forgiveness. So we're actually going to uh, focus first on the law of unity. So in Amos uh, chapter three and three, it reads, can two walk together unless they are agreed, unless they are in unity? And what is this talking about, right? So you have people who uh, say that they're saved say that they're born again, but yet are bad-mouthing uh, their brother or sister in the Messiah, yet they are bad-mouthing uh, leadership or rejecting certain parts of the teaching of truth They're saying, well, I don't agree with that and just completely throw it out. Well, no. So if we're walking in unity, then we must have a keen understanding of uh, kingdom concepts and precepts and ensure that we are not coming up with our own way of doing things. I'm reminded of a show um, that I was watching, and I believe I've shared this example before, but I'll, I'll share it now. Um, and it was a basketball show, and um, it was a, a team, and there was this one particular player who was very talented, very gifted, um, you know, and basically he would get frustrated with his coach because he felt like his coach should make a different decision or coach, you need to put me in because I can, I know what to do. I can handle this by myself. Right. But that contradicts the whole point of having a team. Right. And so because that coach perceived that arrogant attitude in that player, he wouldn't play him and they would lose it. <laughs> and so the point is, you know, it is better for us to lose and be in unity, stay with me, than for us to be independent and be out there by ourselves. And there, and, and the scripture says pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. So even though it may seem like you're standing up for right, if you're doing it in an arrogant way or doing it the wrong way, you're breaking unity, you're breaking fellowship. So we should never question uh, Elohim's leadership. And this is something that I, I actually, I'm so glad that the father showed 
um, show this even about myself because one of my personality traits, I've always been the one to fight for what is right and fight for what is fair. And so an example of this may be, you know, a time where I felt I, I wondered like, okay, well, how is it fair for that person to be doing that? And, um, you know, but here I, I've been faithful. I've been, uh, you know, showing up. Why is it okay for them to do that? However, it was never my place to correct or to put that person uh, in their place or tell them off or whatever, because I'm not their pastor, nor am I their king, nor am I their Elohim. I didn't create them. So uh, basically, it's more important for us to flow together in unity, even to stand up for what we think is right. Our righteousness is as a, a filthy rag, as the scripture uh, tells us. So it's better for us to be submitted to leadership, for us to obey the word of the king, for us to allow the Holy Spirit to work some things out versus us breaking fellowship and getting out of unity. All right, because you have some people right now who um, don't are, aren't a part of a congregation because they've seen other people being a hypocrite in the church. But I thought you served Elohim. So see, that's that's kind of what I mean, that now you've gotten yourself out of position. You've broken fellowship because you saw something that you felt was not right. Two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> so we have to uh, we have to understand the concept of unity. OK, so uh, there is a a common saying that says what birds of a feather flock together. So when I am operating in unity, that concept denotes a oneness in identity. Now, something that um, the father references several times through that, throughout scripture is how he is developing a nation, how families are the foundation of uh, of the kingdom, of building the kingdom. So, you know, one thing I think about is my own family and how, you know, when I had my children <laughs> and everybody was saying, um, these babies look just like their daddy. And I'm glad that they do because they should. But for a moment, I'm like, now, wait a minute now. Now I've done, went through labor, did all these things. And you mean to tell me they don't look like me? No. But actually, they have shared uh, features, of course, of both of us. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we should uh, we should be a duplicate of our father. We should be an imprint that whenever people look at us, and this this goes to you know, especially with a congregation. And you know, let me say this as well: that the father has placed shepherds. Um, over congregations and some things, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of an example of this. Um, let's just say, for example, there is a, a function and, and the, uh, the leader has asked, or the pastor, I should say, has said, okay, everyone, you know, we want to get together and fellowship and I want everyone to wear um, red, red shirt, you know, with your, uh, with the, we have these fight for the family shirts, visit our bookstore. They're a uh, great shirt. But anyway, we have these fight for the family shirt, but you, you hate the color red. So you decide, well, I mean, that's, you know, no big deal. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show up in blue. Well, you're breaking order. See, even though it may seem small, it may seem insignificant. We should always go the extra mile to be in unity, to flow together with one and to make sure that whatever the, um, you know, there's something that we say, and that is my pastor's request is my ability to get the job done. And that is not us uh, putting him on a pedestal, although we should honor our pastor. But what that is, is when we catch and see the vision that he has cast, we want to flow with that. We don't want to come up with our own thing. We don't want to make excuses as to why we can't get it done. We just want to make sure that we get it done. All right. So wasn't expecting it to go this way, but we're going to continue on. So unity, that concept, again, it denotes a oneness in identity, duplication, a family imprint. So, and but what matters most is the source. You know, there's a scripture that says, can the blind lead the blind? 
And the answer is what? Yes, but they will both fall in the ditch. So we have to make sure that whenever we are on one accord, whenever we are um, in unity with our prayer partner, with our best friend, with our husband, with our mother, whoever it may be, we have to look at the source and say, what we are agreeing on, are we sure that this lines up with kingdom concepts? Because we can be in unity and still be out of order. So we don't ever want to in there. And we're, we're going to look at an example of this, of a, of a couple who was in unity, but out of order. So what matters most is the source. Um, all right. So the next one is in order to be unified, we must have clear vision and vision we know comes from the Hebrew olive bet, ayin, and it is spelled uh, ayin yud nun. And the uh, pictograph that it comes from is an eye. And then another one is a spring. And see, uh, for those who don't know, water actually comes forth from the earth. So that's what it's representing. It's representing source, is representing uh, clarity of sight, of vision. So in order to be unified, we have to have clear vision of the kingdom and what he wants us to do. Just like in Matthew 18, when it says, if you ask anything, then it'll be done. Well, the, yes, if you ask anything according to his will, but if I don't know what his will is, then I could be coming into a covenant with something that is counter kingdom. So in order to agree in prayer, all parties must agree in the faith and understand kingdom concepts of prayer. So be very selective when you're picking your quote unquote prayer partner who is coming up with things that are uh, going against what the word of Elohim teaches or whose lifestyle is spotted and disqualifies them. Okay, so Elohim hates people who break unity. Michele, um Chapter 6 and 16, it reads, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. So what is that talking about? That's talking about a person who is breaking unity, a person who, you know, you have people who, like I like I was saying, say that they're, I, well, I just, I just tell the truth. I just tell it how it is. No, what you're doing is you're breaking unity. What you're doing is you're being a goat or a person who, um, or, 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 for, or, uh, being tear, you know, see wheat and tear grows up in the same field, but tear, um, uh, when the word comes or when the wind comes and the wind we know, um, represents the Holy spirit. When the wind comes, the tear stands straight up, but the wheat will bow and be submissive. So a person who is sowing discord or breaking, uh, breaking unity, breaking fellowship, they always have something else to do, always have a new way. Or what if we do it like this? Why can't we do it like that? Always questioning, always uh, really rebelling against the flow of the group. So we have to be careful about that because the father says he hates that. He hates when people do that. Romeo 16 and 17, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, it says. For such persons do not serve uh, Yahweh, the Messiah, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. See, that's what we were talking about earlier, about how the enemy, he wants to isolate us. He wants to prey on those who aren't mature in the faith. That's why we must be submitted to a shepherd um, and, and to our pastor and leadership so that we aren't easily swayed. Okay, so Elohim hates people who break unity, hates that act, I should say. All right. So unity requires denying self and drawing from the source, drawing from the source. 
Interdependence is a kingdom concept. And we already talked about this briefly about how there is safety in numbers. Okay. So we must make sure that we are surrounded by believers and submitted to leadership. All right, let's keep moving. So let's look at uh, Philippians 2. And it reads, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united, there's that unity again. See, I'm united with the Messiah, right? I'm not united with what Alicia, I'm not trying to get people to do what Alicia wants them to do. I'm trying to accomplish the will of the Father. So if you are united with the Messiah, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. He said, please make me happy. It makes me joyful to see believers being what? Like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So what is this communicating? There's that concept of what? Interdependence, of unity, of being uh, on one accord with one mind and with one vision. And when we do this, we are unstoppable. So for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to give two examples of this, of the power of unity. One is in second, uh, the Beer Hamim, a second Chronicles five and 13. And it says, indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one pause. <laughs> I have to pause right here because you have some people, especially those who are musically inclined, uh, the lead, those who, uh, are in praise and worship, you have to be really, really, really careful. You have some people who will say, uh, or, or who will get upset with the pastor for limiting or giving them a time limit uh, for praise and worship, saying, well, you can't limit the, the spirit. No, you're in pride. And you want to do what you want to do and sing and, and glorify yourself because if we have a keen understanding of the kingdom concept, we'll know that if the if, if the shepherd of the house has set some things in order, we need to flow with the order. And if he then goes and says and allows us to continue, then that's what we are to do. And I, you know, I, I say we because I've been involved in praise and worship for a long time. And I've seen a lot of things and you got a lot of trumpeters and singers, a lot of musicians and singers who have exalted their gift above the word and who break unity because they're trying to uh, put so much focus on, uh, on quote unquote ministering in song, dance, whatever it is. But really that's a spirit of division trying to enter. And the, the, um, uh, the musical ministry uh, or worship using music. See, we don't need music to worship. We don't need music to be unified. And, and those very same people, then when the word is going forth, you should be the main ones uh, receptive and being able to receive. But instead, what do you see? The musicians on their phone, the musicians distracted, the musicians going in and out while the word is, is being taught. So that's what I mean by not being unified. Okay, so let's continue. But when they were what as one, making one sound to be heard and praising and thanking Yahweh, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised Yahweh, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house the house of Yahweh was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of Yahweh filled the house. So again, when, when we are as one, when we are in unity, nothing can stop it. And the, the spirit of Yahweh inhabits our worship and is pleased when we are on one accord. All right. And then in Bereshit, 11. Now, again, remember earlier, we talked about how when we do come together in unity, we got to make sure that we're agreeing with what the king has established. 
So in uh, chapter 11, now the whole earth had one language and one speech and skipping down, but Yahava came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. So again, this is, um, hmm. all right. So go back and read in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 11, where um, basically everyone had got together and said, oh, I have a great idea. Why don't we build a tower to the heavens? Come on, space, uh, space center, because why are we, okay, <laughs> Why? And, and, you know, humans are still doing this to this day. Now, the father, he created this the uh, this earth for us to inhabit, for us to live. Um, and, 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 you know, and we know that whenever you go in space, you can't breathe. Why do you think that is? Because we're not supposed to be there. So I say that to say people are still doing the same thing, trying to, uh, quote unquote, discover and, and uh, you know, understand um, the world. Well, let's understand the space and dominate in the space that the father put us in instead of trying to make something fit our own agenda in the, in the name of discovery, right? So that's out of order. But anyways, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, so bear a sheet. So that, what did they say? They said, oh, we want to build a tower to space. We want to get all the way up. We want to go all the way to the moon, to the stars. And uh, and what they were doing, they actually were uh, fallen angels. They wanted to worship another God and they wanted to have sex high, high up. So, so I say that to say the source was evil. Although they were unified, their source was evil. And what did the father say? Did he say, oh, it'll never work? No, he said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So what did he have to do? He had to um confuse the languages because they were going to accomplish it see so that goes to show that whenever we come together we are powerful but what fight are you fighting right what is it that you're trying to accomplish even as it relates to unity see you have some people hosting prayer meetings and coming together let's pray for our city let's pray against this let's pray against that but yet you don't have a pastor you're breaking uni uh, unity and fellowship, or you have people who a mother and daughter, they're coming into agreement, but yet that, that daughter or that mother, they don't submit to their husband's leadership. See, the father, he wants us to uh, be, in, be one with him, one with his agenda. We can do a good thing and it still be the wrong thing. All right. So uh, let me check my time. We are we are just about out of time. So um, let's end here. The power of unity. In Messiah chapter four, it reads, now the full number of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles or the emissaries were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Yeshua and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the uh, uh, emissary's feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. The power of unity destroys poverty destroys lack. See, when I am not just worried about building my own house while the father's house lays in ruin, while I am not just, see, we are blessed to do what? Be a blessing. When we are operating in unity, that means that I have to give up uh, me trying to hold on to everything for myself and submit to the kingdom's design of commonwealth that everyone uh, is able to have what they need. This is how the father has it set up. So the 
so-called church or the local congregation, the more we understand this concept and the more people truly um, are flowing in unity, we will see this manifest that everyone who has joined together uh, is not operating in lack. All right. So um, we are out of time, but I definitely want to encourage encourage you to continue seeking the father, his way of doing things and his agenda so that when we do come into a, to agreement and when we're operating in agreement, that we're doing so in unity with Elohim, not just because uh, me and my prayer partner uh, want to get something done, but, but father reveal to me the timing Reveal to me how to do it. Reveal to me what to say, your precepts, your laws, right? Asking him for our daily provisions, that we are led daily, that we are uh, uh, hearken to his voice each and every time. All right, so I pray that the word was a blessing. May Elohim had, may Elohim add his blessing to those who not only hear, but those who do his word. Thank you so much for joining and shalom.